this evening as uh, we're taking some time out of our week to have a Bible study. And uh, I'm Kevin Smith, and I'm one of the ministers here at the Gadsden Church of Christ. This is April the 15th, uh, 2020. And uh, this week we're going to continue our study in uh, the book of James. We'll remember from last week that James has already discussed how we can uh, turn our trials into triumphs as he dealt with trials in general in verses 2 through 8 of chapter 1. Then in verses 9 through 11 that I want to start with uh, tonight and then we'll move on to verses 12 through 18. Uh, but here in verses 9 through 11 he discusses specifically uh, the trials regarding being uh, poor and being rich and the attitudes that uh, Christians should have uh, about being rich or being poor. Let's read there in chapter 1 starting at verse 9. says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exultation, but let the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flowers falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. So here in James, the book about spiritual maturity, James is offering some advice on the trials of poverty and of wealth. And, and let's just talk for a couple of minutes about uh, wealth and, and poverty and how either one of those situations can be a problem, and specifically they can be a problem for the Christian. Uh, in poverty, then we may be tempted to uh, curse God. Um, we have the example of Job's wife, when they had lost everything, then she encouraged her husband to uh, curse God and die, Job chapter 2 and verse 9. Uh, many folks today have the same attitude as Job's wife when things don't go exactly as they uh, want them to go, uh, then um, they want to blame God and, and curse God and turn their back upon God rather than continuing to walk toward God and with God. But the other side of that is in, uh, in wealth, uh, then we may be tempted to forget God. Just as, as poverty may cause us to um, curse God or want to curse God, then our wealth may cause us to uh, forget God. God warned the Israelites about this um, and that this very thing might happen to them. And that's mentioned in Deuteronomy uh, 
uh, chapter 8, verses 10 through 17, and then we go on to see that this, in fact, did happen uh, to the children of Israel in Hosea chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And so we can understand, I think, that um, both poverty and wealth can have their own potential uh, for causing problems in our spiritual life. Um, so I want to consider this idea that James sets forth of having a joy uh, either in poverty or in um, wealth. And as we read here in uh, verses 9 through 11 of chapter 1, if we're poor, then we can rejoice that we have been exalted. See, God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, and James chapter 2 and verse 5. We're reminded that it was the poor uh, that first had the gospel preached to them, as we see in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. We're reminded from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 20 uh, through 22 uh, that it is the poor slave that becomes Christ's freed man. So even if we're poor, even if we're in poverty materialistically, then we can still be spiritually rich. And we can be on equal standing uh, with other Christians and with all Christians. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But then for the rich, we can rejoice if we're rich um, because we've been humbled. As those in poverty, we've been exalted. And if we're rich, we have been humbled. See, as Christians, we've been humbled uh, by becoming Christ's slave. Again, I would mention 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. And we have been humbled by being placed on an equal par uh, with all Christians, uh, in which riches mean um, nothing. Revelation chapter 3, verses 11 through 19. See, it means nothing, um, spiritually speaking, uh, if... If I'm rich in the world, it also means nothing spiritually speaking if, if I'm poor by the world's standards. But as we think about this humbling uh, for uh, the rich, we need to realize the, the benefits of that kind of humbling. So we should be humble to realize that our riches are only temporary here that we read in verses 10 and 11. We can also see that in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 5, and 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. But also we should be humbled or be thankful that we're, we're humbled as Christians and have a humble attitude toward our Riches, because riches are unable to redeem our soul. doesn't matter how much money that we have. The Bible tells us that we came into this world with nothing and we're going to leave it with nothing. So all of the money in the world is not able to save us. It's not able to redeem our soul. Psalm chapter 49, verses 6 through 8 and verses 13 through 20. We're also taught that a love of money is, it's a quagmire. Uh, and it's a source of self-inflicted injuries. 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. In other words, it's, it's good that in, in coming to Jesus that we find these things out. And if we don't find these things out, and as, as Christians, we're blessed that we're able to find these things out, or otherwise we might have made the same mistake that many are making today in thinking that money provides true security. But our faith leads us to be reminded of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21 that had so much and had so much that he really didn't have a place to put it and he was concerned about where he was going to put all of his stuff but yet it was it was too late as his soul was going to be required of him and all of that stuff meant nothing so even in the trials of poverty or wealth there can be a cause for Rejoicing. See, Jesus is the great equalizer, exalting the, the poor who are rich in faith or humbling the wealthy by uh, basing their salvation not on wealth, not on that which can be bought, but rather on that which cannot be purchased it cannot be bought and that being the blood of of Jesus and the obedience of a humble and contrite spirit we think about Jesus being the great equalizer we think about it in in our mind's eye then we may think that the poor are here and the rich are here well Jesus being the great equalizer he exalts the poor and he humbles the rich and therefore we become on even ground as we continue to think about that example he may exalt the poor all the way to here or he may humble the rich all the way to here but still Jesus is that great equalizer and realizing these things and in keeping these thoughts in our uh, mine will help us to learn to be uh, content. And that's really what, what God desires of his children, whether we're in poverty or whether we're in wealth, and that is to be uh, content. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul said, Now that I speak not in respect of what, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So the important correct question is not how rich we are, but I think more importantly is how rich in faith are we. Moving on into verses 12 through 18, then James considers to talk to the Christian, and here he's going to address the, the Christian and their temptations. Certainly one of the greatest challenges in living the Christian life is dealing with temptation. Um, maybe this is especially true for new Christians. It can be frustrating to know that your sins have been forgiven, and yet many cases even immediately uh, folks find themselves bombarded by temptation to continue in uh, the sin that they've just been forgiven of. In James chapter uh, 1, verses 12 through 18, we, we find some helpful words for the Christian. And here in this passage, we find those helpful words in the form of a promise 
to those who endure temptation. Uh, we find it to be helpful in words of caution not to wrongfully impugn the source of those temptations. And then thirdly, we find an understanding. and We can be encouraged um, as we look and, and consider an understanding uh, of how sin develops. Let's read verses 12 through 18 in chapter 1. It said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. <clears throat> Let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and in, enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he... He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits in his creatures. As we begin in verse 12 here, then first of all, we notice that promise that we mentioned could be an encouragement to us. See, the man who endures temptation will be blessed Scripture tells us the word for blessed here from the Greek means happy. The, the nature uh, of this happiness enjoyed is, is described as the verse continues. As it basically says, for, for after he's been proved, he will receive the crown of life. After we overcome the temptation, when we overcome the temptation, if we overcome the temptation. We have here the promise is that of eternal life. And the promise is given by him who cannot lie, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. The promise is given to those that demonstrate or that prove uh, their love for God by their endurance of the temptation. And so to Christians facing temptations, first we have an encouraging word, a promise. But as we read on, though, we notice that there is a word of caution, not just of encouragement and of promise, but that of, Caution. Verse 13, let no man say that they're tempted by God. That is, we should not blame God for our temptation. For God is holy. He cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone to do evil. Now, I think we have to understand and may be good to point out here that there's a difference in trial and a difference and in temptation. There's a difference in being tried and in being tempted. I, I believe, and I mentioned it last week, that God may test our faith. God may send us trials that prove to make us stronger but those trials are not temptations because God will not tempt his children. God will not tempt his creation to sin um, or to do wrong. So we don't need to be deceived into such thinking, and that's pointing out in verses 16 through 18. See, God is a source of good, uh, and not evil. 
goes on to tell us that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And as an example of that, then uh, it was his own will uh, or with his own will that he brought us forth. He did that by the word of truth and that being the gospel, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, so that we might be as kind of first fruits, the cream of the crop. And I believe, I'm not, I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, but Scripture tells us that those that overcome temptation our first fruits, the cream of the crop of his creatures. So certainly this being true, God would not tempt us with evil. In fact, through the words of, of James, God gives us insight into the development of sin and that can help us to overcome sin. And so just as he's, he gave us a promise and just as he gives us caution, then also verses 14 and 15, we can have an understanding, an understanding of how sin develops. And, and the key to, to overcoming something is to know about it to be educated about it, to have an understanding about it. We've been involved in that the last several weeks. The understanding that has been brought forth regarding COVID-19 and the social distancing and the things that are being done. We've seen example, we see now how, how the decisions that uh, were made by the government and, and them encouraging us to do certain things that were not comfortable for us. See, the understanding that we have of that, we see the end result and how the the curve is flattening, the deaths are are diminishing, the new cases are diminishing. Simply because of an understanding. Well, I think James gives us that in regard to, to sin. And we can understand how sin develops. And the first stage in the development of sin is temptation. Uh, as we see in verse 14. And this temptation involves two things. Uh, that being lust or desire, as we read in the New King James Version. And lust is simply a strong desire um, for something. But then the second aspect of temptation is enticement, and that is an opportunity uh, to satisfy that desire. So if we put it like a mathematical uh, equation, then temptation equals desire plus opportunity. Desire alone is not going to tempt us, but we've got to have the, uh, the opportunity uh, to satisfy that desire. I'm reminded as a, as a small boy, I stayed with not just me, all of my siblings, but I remember as... I was growing up and we would stay with the grandparents and oh, I remember the meals that we would eat there and uh, I can remember vividly eating eating breakfast there, sitting at, um, at the bar and I remember having lunch and usually our lunch consisted of a, of a sandwich cut in half from corner to corner. You didn't cut it across, you cut it from corner to corner and then after we ate lunch, we would get two cookies. Not one, not three, but two. And my grandparents were modest folks. They didn't have a lot. They came through the Depression and 
they were humble in their outlook on life. And, and my grandmother was very firm that we could have two cookies. I remember as a boy, and I knew where those cookies were, and and one day I was, I was tempted. I was tempted to steal some cookies because I wanted them. I had the desire. I had the lust for that, but I also had a good chance to get them. I had the opportunity. My mom had gone outside, and so I, I acted upon that temptation. And that really brings us to our next point. See, it's not a sin to be tempted. There was nothing wrong with me wanting more cookies. There was nothing wrong with me having the opportunity to get more cookies. But what happened next, we could say in this example, is the development of the sin itself in verse 15. See, temptation leads to sin only when we act upon that desire and that opportunity. When we yield to the desire and the opportunity, then that's when sin is produced. Sin, therefore, requires this added step of action. Again, if we put it into a mathematical uh, equation or in mathematical terms, then sin equals desire plus opportunity plus action. Then as we understand the development of sin, and we can see that the final stage is the consequence. The consequence of unforgiven sin is death, again, verse 15. And this death is a spiritual death, that separation uh, from God, which is the wages of sin, Romans chapter 6 and verse uh, 23. And ultimately, that death uh, involves eternal punishment, uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. So again, the final mathematical equation or term that we will consider in this progression, development of, of sin, is desire plus opportunity plus action plus no forgiveness equals punishment. Sin and Satan will have overcome if we receive this final punishment. They will have won the battle. But with this understanding that James gives us here in this very practical book, the understanding of how sin develops, then, then we're in a better position to overcome sin. And I do want to spend a few minutes looking at how to overcome sin. Just some practical thoughts. First of all, uh, if, if desire is the beginning uh, in the development of sin, then we need to change our desires the best place for us to begin since this is the beginning of the development of sin then then we can be begin by changing our desire if we want to overcome sin and we need to bear in mind that this is part of christian growth is that of changing our desires romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 uh, don't be conformed but change, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's also brought forth in Galatians chapter 5 um, and verse 24. How do we change our desires? 
Well, we need to notice and understand that the Word of God has always been instrumental in helping people to overcome sin. Uh, Psalm chapter 119, verse 11. We have the example of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 10. He, as, as he dealt with the temptation of, of Satan, Jesus answered that temptation with the Word of God. He said, it is written... So I think we need to understand that if we want to overcome sin, first of all, we need to change our desires. And we need to realize that the Word of God can change our desires. We have folks and we know folks that, that struggle with, with addictions, struggle with all kinds of sin, and many times the reason that we continue in such things is because we won't allow and we don't allow God to change us through his word. Oh, we hope God will change us. We wish that God would change us. But we're not doing our part in allowing God to change us. We can read of God's love and of his long suffering and his mercy. We desire to serve him. Psalm chapter 116 verses 12 through 14. We can read and we know that sin is has consequences. We know that sin is is damnable and we come to hate it. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 104. So the more that we study God's word, the more that we, more time that we spend uh, in God's word, then the less likely we will be to have the desire to sin. There, thereby, that is the way uh, that we can begin to overcome sin. As Barney Fife would say, we need to nip it in the bud. And the way that we can, can start to nip it in the bud is to change our desire. But changing our desire takes time. And as we're in the process of changing our desires, there are some other things that we can do. And, and secondly, I would mention if we want to overcome sin, remember opportunity Desire plus opportunity. Well, we need to limit our opportunities. We're tempted only when desire and opportunity are both present. So while we work to, to change our desires then we also should be interested in limiting the opportunities to fulfill wrongful desires. And this can be done by asking God for, for his help to providentially guide us and to, to help us. As Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6, verses, uh, verse 13, and Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Not only do we need to ask God to help us, but we need to cooperate with God. The way that I look at it is we need to help God answer uh, our prayers. And many would say, well, God doesn't need our help in answering prayers. No, but we need to have an attitude that we need to be helping him. We need to be cooperating with God. We don't need to be working against God. We don't need to pray for God to help us overcome a temptation, and yet make a decision that we're going to put ourselves in a position to be tempted. We need to limit those opportunities, purposefully avoiding situations that might excite our lust or our desires. 
We need to follow the example of David in Psalm chapter 101, verses 3 and 4. We need to limit our opportunities. The example of Job in Job chapter 31 in verse 1. We need to avoid those who might influence us in a negative way might encourage us to sin with them. Again, David sets a good example in this uh, regard in Psalm chapter 101, verses 6 and 7. Also, Paul adds to that warning, a very familiar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Uh, Be not deceived, evil companions corrupt good morals. We need to realize that. But even if we uh, lessen our uh, desire and lessen the opportunities, it's still unlikely that we'll remove every desire and opportunity to sin in this life. So what then? Well, we need to exercise self-control. We don't need to just change our desires. We don't need to just limit our opportunities, but we need to exercise self-control. God gave us the good sense to make good decisions. Sometimes we may find ourselves in a situation that's not best for us to be in. That doesn't give us the opportunity to sin or give us the right to sin. We've got to use our good sense. We've got to use the self-control that God gave to us. I'm a firm believer, and I mention this from time to time. I believe many things are sin for us simply because we lose our self-control. Anything that has control over me rather than me having control over it is sinful whether it's something I eat, something I drink, something I smoke, something I take, something I watch. If I've lost self-control, then I've entered the realm of sin because that's when we yield to action in fulfilling our sinful desires. And if we can control ourselves so as not to yield, then we can overcome sin. How does a Christian exercise self-control? Well, we know that it's mentioned as just one of the things in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. When we become Christians, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. The Spirit is God's agent, God's instrumental agent by which he imparts uh, strength to us and a spiritual strength to us, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. And so, When we're strengthened by the Spirit, we're able to put to death the deeds of the body. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. And we understand, we should understand that it's through a knowledge of God's word and a faith in God's word that um, a Christian believes and has this divine help. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. This, This help is not going to come from God through some other means outside of the word. The spirit comes to us through the word. Our faith comes to us through the word. The knowledge of what God desires for us comes through the word. Oh, certainly it's proper to pray for it. Paul did that on behalf of the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. But equally important 
is for us to act upon it, trusting that we're not alone as we try to do God's will, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. A commercial a few years ago, we still see it. I believe it was Nike, just do it. And that's what we, the attitude that we need to have as Christians, just do it, just exercise self-control, just do our part. A Christian has no excuse for yielding to temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. But sadly, there are times that we don't take advantage of the strength that God provides us through his word and through his spirit. There are times that we give in to temptation and there are times that we sin. What then? Well, we need to obtain forgiveness. Remember that sin is only victorious when it results in the punishment. But if we obtain forgiveness through uh, the blood of Christ, we can avoid that punishment and thereby still overcome sin. 1 John chapter 2, verses one and two. Yes, Christ is truly the propitiation for our sins. That that big word that we only hear in church. Propitiation. The appeasement of God's wrath. Jesus appeases the wrath of God, and he appeased the wrath of God through his shed blood and through that blood we were forgiven of our past sins when we were united with him in baptism acts chapter 2 and verse 38 acts chapter 22 and verse 16 romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 but also by his blood we can be forgiven of our present sins if we pray and or if we repent first and then pray, uh, if we confess our sins uh, to God, Acts chapter 8 and verse 22 and 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. At any time, we can make the decision to overcome sin. We can, can overcome sin that have been committed in the past if we're not a Christian, we do that by being baptized, as we've mentioned. If we are a Christian, then we do that by repenting uh, and confessing those sins to God. See, we can, we can overcome sin by stopping its development, and we can stop the development at any one of the four stages that we've talked about. And if we noticed carefully in the things that we've talked about this evening, then we've seen that at each of the four points in the development of sin, God is able and willing to help us overcome sin. God helps us to control our desires by providing his word to renew our minds. God helps us to limit the opportunities through his providence as we can pray for such. God helps us to exercise our self-control over our actions through his spirit and through a knowledge of his word that strengthens uh, the inner man. And God helps us to obtain forgiveness through the blood of his son as we repent and pray. James offers some vital information in regard to um, sin and in regard to temptation. And I hope that you'll spend some time considering the things that we've talked about this evening. Let's bow and pray as we close.
Father, we're truly grateful for today and we're thankful for the time that we've had together this evening. We're so thankful for your word and we're thankful that we're able to spend time in it to learn more of your will for our lives. Father, we pray for forgiveness. We pray that we would be encouraged to, uh, to understand uh, temptation uh, and the, the development of sin in our lives and help us to do all that we can do uh, to never act upon the temptation that may be presented to us. Thank you for loving us, and we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening, and it's our prayer that you would uh, be safe, and God bless. Amen.